Hello everyone, it is Norm again. Thank you very much for joining us for this very special post Xbox Showcase edition of the Normcast. And sincerely thank you because there is certainly no shortage of Xbox Showcase themed videos popping up on the YouTubes right now. And I would wager that some of them are actually going to show gameplay footage instead of what I'm doing, which is talking over this completely unrelated art stream that I just happen to have on my hard drive. Fortunately, given your good taste, I'm certain that you are resourceful people who can find the video footage if you so require it. In any case, the clock is ticking, the content's getting still, and I've got other things I need to do with my day, so let's get started with my thoughts on the Xbox Showcase and Starfield Direct. And no, this is not going to be a comprehensive game-by-game uh, -game breakdown of the show. Just like for the PlayStation Showcase, I will simply be highlighting whatever specific elements, one, caught my eye, and two, that I'm able to actually remember. Only a few marbles left rolling around in this particular melon. Let's get started. Okay, so just to start off, uh, just overall, I thought the show was great. Barring one of those jump out of your seat and pound on the head of the guy sitting in front of you, crazy cannot believe this E3 announcements, this showcase was right up there with the very best that Xbox has ever done for any E3 or E3 adjacent show. Pretty much every game announced was to one extent or another a winner, or at the very least, forgettable enough that they didn't stand out as a lone turkey in the announcement lineup. The two big whispers on the rumor mill, Fable and Avowed, both got their moment in the sun. More on that in just a bit. Plenty of surprises, and for me at least, the ridiculously self-indulgent 45-minute Starfield presentation fully delivered. If E3 still existed, this one would have won it. As it is, we can at least say that it was definitively better than the PlayStation Showcase this year, and while the Summer Games Fest was never really in the running, yeah, beat that too. But this particular showcase was indeed exactly the sum of its parts, and so let's go over some of those parts in detail. Starting with Fable. Now, despite some fairly suggestive teasing on Microsoft's part, Fable was, up until today's show, or whenever you're listening to this, Fable was a question mark on the roster. Now, a lot of folks were expecting it to be on there in some capacity, but especially given how things have gone off late, nobody was really counting on it. If it did show, smart money was going to be that it either opened or closed the show, and as it turned out, it did, in fact, open the show. The trailer, which uh, featured Richard... I'm going to butcher his name, I apologize. Ayodade uh, Moss from the IT crowd. It was funny, and per the uh, on-screen text, it was actually in-game footage, not in-engine footage. And it did, to a certain extent, put, uh, put well, some of my fears about the franchise to rest. Playground games, obviously known mostly for Forza Horizon, not really a uh, an RPG developer, traditionally. So nobody outside the industry really knew, well... One, why they were chosen for this, given that they are a racing developer, but also whether they would handle the uh, the tone of the Fable series reliably. Because Fable, for all of its farts and chicken jokes, is not just a waka waka funny RPG, it is a very Britishly funny RPG. And my immediate inability to put into words exactly what makes British comedy British comedy is indicative of the sort of nuance that they would have to navigate with this. I will say right now that I was one of the few people I know of who really was not particularly convinced by the uh, the CG Fable trailer that was released a year or two ago when it was first announced. Being, as that did center around a uh, fluttering forest fairy being unceremoniously eaten by a frog. Quite apart from the distinct possibility that we were simply being subjected to the visual realization of some animator's deviant internet searches, what humor there was there was more on the line of mid 2000 violence happens to some cute thing internet cartoon. It really did not scream fable to me. And in fairness, the, the new uh, trailer doesn't immediately call forth the, the distinct voice of the Fable series, but it's a lot more in line. The fact that the giant narrating the trailer is named Dave is, in particular, a kind of Terry Pratchett-y sort of touch, and I approve. With that said, it was not a lingering trailer. We really didn't get a, a sense of what the world gameplay was going to be like, and we also really didn't get much of a sense of uh, the distinctly Fable elements. I, I guess we did see 
see maybe a Balverine and uh, did not see any of the Hobbses, we did see a chicken. In any case, it was a, a very pretty trailer, and at the least, it was a very strong start to the show. Next up was the trailer for the long-rumored open-world Star Wars game from Ubisoft, uh, Star Wars Outlaws. In complete honesty, I'm not sure if we saw any actual gameplay in that trailer, and the only real takeaway I can get away from that one, uh, with, with the exception of just that there's going to be a female protagonist and it has a uh, cute alien sidekick, was that Phil Spencer pronounced Ubisoft as Ubisoft, and that might very well be the correct way to pronounce it. That's just the sort of thing I'd expect the French to pull. Moving on, we saw what I assume was the first trailer for Payday 3, and it looked like Payday. In truth, I, uh, I always liked Payday's mechanics, but I always felt they would be better married to an open-world game, like if, if the mechanics of Payday were integrated into a Grand Theft Auto. I like how intricate the mechanics and planning are, but it can get a bit repetitive when that's the entire game. Granted, this is coming solely from a single-player perspective. I assume that in multiplayer, the lack of gameplay variety is covered by actual humans. A poor trade-off, in my opinion. Okay, so next up, a big one, it was Avowed, Obsidian's Avowed. What many have taken as Obsidian's kind of answer to the Elder Scrolls, uh, taking place in their own Pillars of Eternity universe. I was actually genuinely surprised to see this one in the middle of the showcase rather than uh, at the very end, although I can sort of understand given the contentious reaction the trailer has received since its debut. This largely stemming from the disparity between the previous announcement trailer, which was very dark and had uh, ultra-realistic CG-rendered battle gameplay with uh, flaming arrows raining down on legions of the undead, and then this one, uh, the art style was significantly brighter, the uh, textures were, I would say, on first glance less detailed. There was a bit of a rift between this trailer and what we saw last time. With that said, my own personal take on the trailer is that it uh, it committed the sin of focusing mainly on combat, which, again, I've said this before, in the modern era, now that we have refined combat over several generations, video combat is reliably decent, and it all starts looking pretty samey. There were some bells and whistles on display with uh, magic use, some fancy hand motions, but what I would have really rather seen with a RPG like Avowed, particularly an Obsidian RPG, was more of a focus on world interactions, NPC interactions, and a proper story trailer. My guess, I don't know if they actually uh, announced the release date on this particular one, but my guess is that it's just too early for them to make uh, that, that comprehensive an overview trailer. In any case, it's an RPG, it's from Obsidian, I'm still on board. Next up, uh, for my money, was what I would consider probably the biggest and most welcome surprise of the show, and uh, even more surprising, it came in the form of a Sea of Thieves expansion, which I don't play Sea of Thieves, but apparently I'm going to have to start. And the reason I'm going to have to start is because the Sea of Thieves expansion is called The Legend of Monkey Island, and it is, in fact, a full-blown Monkey Island crossover. And this isn't like the, uh, the previous wink and a nod Monkey Island references that were in uh, in the Sea of Thieves uh, earlier, this one was, uh, this one is what appears to be a full single player focused campaign in which uh, you solve Monkey Island adventure game puzzles and uh, interact with the fully 3D rendered inhabitants and uh, grounds of Melee Island from the Monkey Island series. I was watching this trailer with a group of friends when this came on, and throughout the course of it, I was delightedly pointing out Monkey Island staples like the three pirates at the bar and the voodoo lady and stand the salesman with such energy and enthusiasm that I guarantee that these friends of mine are friends no longer. I blame them, they knew what they were getting into. Oh, and uh, that one is actually coming fairly soon. It looks like that's going to be uh, launching uh, in July, which is good because some of the things that I were expecting to come in a lot sooner, I'm looking at you, Cyberpunk, are not coming out until much later in the year. After that was a Microsoft Flight Simulator, uh, either expansion or full-blown sequel. In any case, it looked like Microsoft Flight Simulator. You know pretty much what to expect there, uh, although they are adding what I would say is a fairly welcome mission mode to, uh, to the next expansion. 
Oh, and also uh, some Dune, uh, that is Frank Herbert's Dune, Dune-related DLC in which you are piloting an ornithopter over the Spice Melange Sands. Shy Halud. Flight Simulator is a quality product, if not necessarily one to get super excited over, so bully for it, but then the show changed and the next game up was Hellblade 2. The trailer, which uh, really did not show uh, a lot of substance in terms of story, did display fantastic visuals, but uh, what, what actually caught me with this one was a remarkably effective use of spatial audio. I, I uh, Like I said, I was watching this with a group of friends in VR, and when the voices started whispering, pretty much everybody in the room was turning to the left or right to see if some rando with an amazing radio voice had joined the chat. After that was a trailer for Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth, the continuation of the Yakuza series with new protagonist Ichi, and it looked like a darn good time. If you know, you know. If you don't know, play Yakuza 0. Great game. After that, a trailer for a new Fallout 76 expansion, which... Eh, and then a pretty unique-looking Capcom fighting game. Uh, well, not, not fighting in the sense of, like, Street Fighter, just fighting in the sense of that's how almost every game operates. Video game people just don't talk to each other fast-paced little action game with a, a very charming Japanese art style, weird yokai-ish monsters. It's called Path of the Goddess, uh, and beyond the intriguing art style, don't really know too much about it as yet, but I'd say one to watch. After that, a trailer for Forza Motorsport. Still looks fine, as these things tend to do. Probably the next really notable announcement was a remake of Persona 3, which I know of the Persona series. I have not played it. I know several people who do. I fully understand why this Persona game and the other Persona franchise games appearing on an Xbox console are a big deal, but the ship has already sailed for me. The franchise is too far in. There's no way I'm going to be able to jump in and understand any of it. But for those that observe, yes, there are uh, several Persona games coming to the Xbox, and I think they're going to actually be on Game Pass as well. So if you've got a subscription, actually, I'll dig Rest right now and say that uh, for anybody who does have a Game Pass subscription, this show really did highlight what a tremendous value it is. Not being sponsored to say that, although if anybody from Microsoft is listening, I can be bought. So many of these uh, major releases are going to be day one on Game Pass. It's rare in this day and age that any video game related purchase can be wholeheartedly considered a wise investment, but Game Pass uh, thus far has delivered. After that, or possibly before it, I, uh, I actually don't remember exactly where it fell in the presentation, we got a look at Clockwork Revolution. The trailer was visually pleasing, uh, giving off a lot of Bioshock Infinite slash Dishonored vibes, to the extent that a lot of the discourse after the reveal was, hey, this game is giving off a lot of Bioshock Infinite slash, well, they didn't say Dishonored because it's not quite on that level of popularity, but if they were a bit more sophisticated, they would have said Dishonored. But Bioshock Infinite vibes, that has kind of dominated the conversation about this game, and while it definitely does, I think that's doing it a disservice because I realized, uh, I somehow I didn't catch this during the trailer, I don't know if they said it or not uh, explicitly, but the game is coming from Brian Fargo of Fallout and Wasteland fame and is apparently a fairly deep RPG. So regardless of the origins of the art style, this is definitely one I'm going to be watching. In any case, moving on, the next big one was, uh, was Keanu Reeves reprising his role as Keanu Reeves, shilling for Cyberpunk 2077, in this case, the expansion Phantom Liberty, which is coming out, uh, this September, uh, only 20 days after Starfield. I'm, I'm probably still going to be kind of engaged in that. But the Phantom Liberty trailer looked really nice, as, uh, as almost all of Cyberpunk marketing has thus far, per hands-on reports that were released after the show, Phantom Liberty will be arriving with the 1.7 patch for Cyberpunk, which is going to overhaul quite a few elements of the game, including a new police system, a revamped perk tree for the relic, uh, potentially an entirely new ending of the game. As someone who has felt that all of the uh, patches to date 
released for Cyberpunk 2077 to address its shortcomings, really still have not resolved a variety of fairly basic level gameplay issues with the game. As much as I do acknowledge that it has improved significantly from release, I still very much feel that Cyberpunk has the uh, capacity to be an absolutely fantastic game, and so I am going to watch this one with significant interest. I like the world of Cyberpunk, I like the writing, it just needs a lot more interactivity. After that, a trailer for Cities Skylines 2, which, despite looking an awful lot like Cities Skylines 1, was still welcome news. Then a couple other trailers, I, I think for possibly one more Atlas RPG. And then finally came the one more thing of the show. Only, in my opinion, it was a little bit of a cheat because the one more thing is supposed to be the, you know, big surprise of the show. It's supposed to be a fake out. They're supposed to say, well, goodbye, oh, one more thing. And then they'd show you the hype trailer for the humongous game that everybody assumed was going to be at the show and hadn't been shown off yet. I mean, yes, it is childish. It's like teasing a baby, but there is a tradition behind it. That's why we adhere to it. In any case, the tradition was uh, eschewed somewhat this year because instead of the final trailer, the show transitioned directly to the 45-minute Starfield presentation. Or 40 minutes or however long it was. What I can say definitively is that it was the Starfield presentation and frankly it was great. In truth, nothing that I saw in the Starfield presentation really surprised me given what I know about the game and what I've been, you know, following scraps for for the last three or four years on this, but it did a very good job of showing the state that the game is in. It, looking, uh, it is looking very polished. I know I said I don't care about combat, but it must be noted that combat is much, much improved over what they showed on the previous year's Starfield presentation. A lot more more footage of the planets and cities, a uh, deeper dive into the gameplay systems with the shipbuilding, navigation, character creation. The one real solid takeaway I can get from the, uh, from the Starfield Direct was that this is a big, big game. Just kind of a solid confirmation that this is still going to be the type of Bethesda game where, yes, there is a main quest, yes, you will put 100 hours into it, and yes, you still might not ever roll credits. The presentation for its part said all the right things insofar as assuaging fears about barren worlds, given that there are so many procedurally generated planets in the game. It brought the focus back to the story and the handcrafted elements that the players are going to be interacting with. Everyone I've spoken to who saw the Direct was really impressed by the level of detail that this thing went into. This thing gave us sandwich close-ups. I appreciate that. Reactions to the Direct were uh, pretty much uniformly positive, although I uh, did not look directly into the YouTube comments because I'm not a masochist, and particularly not since it was revealed a few hours after the show that Starfield would be running Horror of Horrors at a lot 30 frames per second on both the Xbox Series S and X. How did the developers live with themselves? In any case, while most people seem to have taken it in stride, it has touched off the predicted comments from the predicted audience, thus representing the one dark cloud of today's presentation. I'm sure I've gone on record for it before, but I don't really care if a game is 30 or 60 FPS, especially not an RPG. I'm not saying I don't notice whether or not a game is, because you can tell if a game's 60, but it's never been a requisite, and honestly, I would love to get some of the uh, most vocal frame rate whiners lined up and force them on air without looking it up to name five specific RPGs that launched in their initial states at 60 FPS or above. I would break my own long-standing person personal policy against schadenfreude for that. But yes, that was the Xbox Showcase altogether. Once again, in my personal opinion, and uh, pretty much from every source I've been able to suss out, a rousing success so far as gaming showcases go. Obviously, as Phil Spencer says, the final test is controller in hand, but I say do not underestimate the value of Ballyhoo. Times are tough, Life is hard and people need reasons to celebrate. Today, I think, was a pretty good day for gaming fans and Xbox owners. 
Anyway, with the showcase wrapped up, I think we are running a bit out of time here. So just to finish things off, and uh, in honor of the forthcoming Starfield and its bold conquest of space, allow me to present you exactly one interesting space fact. Did you know that Luna, the Earth's moon, which is generally agreed upon by both scientists and scholars to be a fairly large object, actually has a diameter that is about 600 kilometers narrower than the continent of Australia? That's right, the moon is 3,400 kilometers in diameter, whereas Australia from east to west is approximately 4,000 kilometers. Pretty embarrassing for the moon, frankly. In fact, given this knowledge, combined with the sheer number of horrible venomous creatures in Australia, one could make a reasonable argument for digging Australia out of the face of the Earth and setting it in near orbit to take over the moon's duties. These mostly being to reflect sunlight, might require a little bleach, and also to turn random people into werewolves. That one I'm confident Australia can handle. In any case, that is all the time we have for today, video gamers. Uh, once again, my name is Norm. Thank you very much for joining us through the entire episode. If you liked what you heard today, then please subscribe, hit the notification button, like the video, and leave a comment, spark a conversation. The YouTube algorithm loves conversations. Alternatively, if you want to directly support our good works, you can go over to our Patreon. The link is in the description. Join up. Patrons at all levels get early access to comics and other things as I make them. Videos, games, you can be part of bringing my idle thoughts to fruition. Otherwise, stay well and we will see each other in the next episode. Normal way. Like the video, video gamers? We have more such wonders to show you, and all you have to do is subscribe and hit the notifications button. I mean, you don't have to. Also consider becoming a patron by following the link to our Patreon page, where we turn your cash into videos, comics, and games using the darkest of dark magics. But mostly just cash.